Welcome to the Think Fitness Life podcast, where the mind and gym come together to help you live your best life. Hosted by two fitness professionals and your personal trainers, Matt Gluckman and Eric Menchie. All right. Welcome back to the Think Fitness Life podcast. And this week, topics include mental bandwidth, hip mobility, and the food pyramid. Um, I love the term mental bandwidth because I think it's a good verbiage to use when trying to describe kind of the willpower you need to either do something or inhibit something. And I think a lot of energy is um, underappreciated in requiring mental bandwidth. And especially with our clients, we see a lot of um, sleep inadequacies that can lead to a fallout of having the discipline or um, the mindfulness to not eat um, a, a sugary drink or a, a candy when you're out and about or to hold true to your goals and remember what you're working for. Um, so I think it's, I, I really like this term, Eric. What, what about you? Do you? Have you ever get into conversations and think that's a good term to use? I do. And I think it's better than what we like to call willpower. Okay. So it, Essentially, it's we're talking very similar lines and out there on the webs, there's a lot of different definitions of bandwidth and one I really kind of liked is it said one's ability to take on more and more work and perform, perform consistently at a high level given the same time constraints. So it's the ability to take on a lot of multitasks, which we do in daily life. Life is not just a one task oriented minded thing. So then we're taking all this together and they're saying with this mental bandwidth, it can actually increase or decrease depending on your abilities and how you use it. And I think that's great. So what it gets into is our system one and system two of our, our basically our brain. So system one is our intuitive, automatic and effortless portion. Mm -hmm. And then system two is more of our accurate, unbiased results which is more deliberate thinking. And what I found is, and I found is mental bandwidth, when it starts to drop, that system two becomes less and less and less. So with that system two dropping, you're just getting poor decision-making. So someone is sitting there and, you know, people bring in bagels and your mental bandwidth is like, I'm going to be strong. I'm not going to touch this. If it starts to get, hindered by like what you said, lack of sleep, lack of exercise, lack of nutrition, poor nutrition, that system too starts to fade mm. and we start making poor decisions. Mm. So I think it's a great term. I love how you're bringing the science into it and the brain specifically because, um, you know, my reason for having reservations about this term is just other people kind of understanding what we're talking about specifically. And it's so true. Like, it's less about willpower and more about setting yourself up for success so that you have the capacity to um, execute what you previously thought about doing. And what I mean by that is I think what I see a lot of times when people first come in and they're first getting, getting, getting going into their their goals and their endeavors that they want to have, especially, you know, it's, it's with the new year, the new decade, uh, people definitely think about like what they want to establish and how they want to change. And sometimes they just throw 10 things at once and none of them are automatic and they require a lot of cognitive effort to, to administer and consistently per perform all of them. And then they, they drop off a month later, two months later and I think it's due to it's it's not about willpower. It's more about having that mental bandwidth. And you know, you made a, a really good point about the stage one, stage two. And, and I want to add to that because there's the three stages of learning. You know, you have your cognitive, you have your associative, and then you have your autonomous. 
So if you're if you can take one thing and you can and you focus intently on improving, um, let's start with sleep, improving the the time you go to bed, improving um, you know your activities before bed, and um, setting your alarm accordingly so you give yourself an adequate time to maybe even naturally wake up before your alarm. Um, you spend two weeks doing that, or you know they say twenty one days, I believe. Uh, the the data provides right. Um, then you can, after now twenty one days, make that more automatic, right? If you've done it successfully and you've done it consistently, it's it should be more autonomous now. And now you freed up that mental bandwidth or that cognitive energy to then focus on the next goal that you will add to this routine. It's not like you get to add one and subtract one. It's you've added one in such a way that now it's autonomous. Now it's just happening effortlessly in a much more habitual way. And that way you're actually going to be directing your behaviors towards the greater good of your system versus having to demand all this cognitive control out of yourself to, to, um, to, to try to make everything happen all at once. Yes. And with that, then you take your ability to be autonomous and then you can use your bandwidth on new tasks, new learning, other things. And that goes to the side. And I think the big thing with bandwidth is it can de- with it running low is because sometimes people take on too much or they don't prioritize things. Right. And they're trying to do a lower level task when at first they should be starting at a higher level task. But once they master that, then it's, okay, we can go to that lower level task. And I think the big takeaway is, is people need to know, okay, if I have a, a list of 10 things that I need to get done, what is my first, the biggest priority here for my health? And tackle that one first and the other ones come along with it. And another kind of important piece too is like it less, it's, it's also just about the individual workout and that, and that second and that set and that, and that rep, because if you, and this is more for probably tr- trainers out there, but if you can observe your client and you've cued them to keep their heel down, but also retract their shoulder back and maybe they're doing like a single leg RDL, right? So we, we can we can Im- image or imagine someone standing on one leg doing a, a hinge pattern and their hip that doesn't have the leg on the ground outwardly rotates and they're off balance, right? So now we are trying to cue them to keep that core engaged, keep that hip turned down, but now they, have, they also have a weight in their hand and that scapula is protracting forward and their spine so out of position. So now th- that person in that moment lacks the mental bandwidth to hold a weighted, you know, to perform a weighted single leg RDL. So you can you know, regress them back. And, you know, for individuals out there, you think about times where you've had difficulty in a movement and you've noticed yourself speed up really quickly, it's usually because you kind of lack the confidence in yourself to to perform in a controlled manner. And maybe you do need to regress the movement, take it a step at a time, master like the hinge part of the single leg RDL, then worry about going loaded so that that hinge part where you keep the hip down becomes more automatic. And then you get to free up that mental bandwidth to maintain that scapular retraction so you have a nice neutral spine when you're doing a loaded hinge. So I think it's also important to touch on the fact that it's it, it's totally a term to use in your thought space and in your vocabulary when thinking about bigger picture goals in, in, in a week and a month at a time, but even also yeah. on, on a really small micro level and the individual exercise and the individual sets and reps. Any, any task you can apply this with and it, you're going to see that change. And where I do think, and you hear this often is people's willpower fades throughout the day. I don't know if I'm a hundred percent on board with it. I think you just get tired through the day. Agreed. And I would say that if you keep a strong, okay, we'll say mental bandwidth is going to decline throughout the day because naturally we're using our brain. We should be getting tired, you know. It's natural, but that doesn't mean that our system one and system two become unhinged. 
I think that's kind of almost like a, oh, I'm tired. Let me just do what's easy. And mm-hmm. I think those times are when sometimes you got to really dig into that bandwidth and say, okay, let me make the best decision. Mm-hmm. So it, yes, it can it can taper. If you're doing a lot of stuff, if you're doing a lot of work for school, well, lifting and having exercise and do that stuff, by the end of the day, you're going to be beat. Expect that. But I still think we, we have the capability of making those the right decisions with that bandwidth. Mm-hmm. It, we might not be able to do, hey, I'm coming home and I'm expected to read 50 pages of intense research. I might not be able to at the end of the day have the bandwidth to comprehend all that. But I 100% percent can go make a healthy salad for a meal because that's a smaller cost. So it's about mm-hmm. cost efficiency at the end of the day. And then the other big thing I just want to mention is, is nutrition is a huge part of this bandwidth. Research was showing that s- subjects with low body mass performed a series of tasks and they got the measurement. And then when they fed them a normal diet and they were s- satiated and they showed higher caloric intakes, they saw a 12% improvement in performance on those tasks. So poor nutrition had definitely plays a role in mental bandwidth. And mm. I think with poor nutrition, along goes with poor sleep quality. So many people need to be in check with fitness, their nutrition, sleep, like you said, 100% in order for them to gain a complete mental bandwidth. You can always work on it. If those aren't perfect all the time, you could still have the bandwidth, but put everything together Mm -hmm. and then it's all going to come to one big piece. And and respect your mental bandwidth, like respect that uh, you know, you, you get feedback from different days of the week or different workouts and different movement patterns and different levels of lack of sleep and different levels of, of nutrition um, in terms of like people adjusting their macros and they're wondering why they're having trouble with something and, and check in with your mental bandwidth. Are you lacking the, the mental energy to focus intently on the things you need to do? Are you not reaching your goals? Dig into that. Why aren't you reaching your goals? And and sometimes I think the reason I love this term love it. is it pulls away the victim blaming. Whereas willpower, you are automatically yeah, trying yeah, yeah. to to put this guilt on somebody. It feels and and I don't want to put dogma on it in, in either regards. But you know what I find is in conversations where people are talking to me about willpower or, or someone describing their lack of willpower, it's like a, I agree. a guilt. It's like a stain. It's a weight on them. And I think that right. that spins it differently because they think like, Oh man, I'm just, I'm lacking discipline. I, 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 I suck. I'm not good at this. And sometimes they feel like they can't right. get it. It's almost like this. It's like a fight. But I don't think, like you said, it doesn't yeah. have to be like, like that. Think about, I think a, a good point to make for people out there listening is think about how refreshed you feel after a weekend or, or even a vacation, like a weekend getaway. You come back and you have all this clarity. It's because you've almost hit that reset button on your random access memory for any computer nerds out there. And, and that mental bandwidth or that bandwidth for that memory got freed up and allowed you to be more available to the life that's in front of you right there in that second, no matter what it, what it is. So I think it's a really important term to um, instill in people's vocabulary and their, their thought space again, because I just find it so valuable in terms of identifying um, kind of inefficiencies in the body and inefficiencies with performance. And sometimes it's not all physical and sometimes um, your your ability or inability to break a habit or to k- keep a habit can come down to lacking the appropriate mental bandwidth. So I think we hit the hit the nail through on that topic. Let's uh, let's move on to hip mobility. I'll defer to you. Doctor, no, I shouldn't call you doctor in just case anyone's listening. He's not a real doctor, but he's he's a mad scientist. 
hopefully one day. One day, yeah. hopefully. Maybe we'll get there. Sky's the limit. Hip mobility is a, a big topic, and it always has been, and I think it always will be, and I think that's the best part for most people. And Why do you think the hips kind are of so what important? Centers us. They're the bottom half of what we are, and – we use them constantly, but I don't think people are really aware of actually what's going on with the hip. And yes, it's plural. We have a left hip and a right hip. A lot of times people just think, oh, it's our, you know, our hip is one giant bone, which is not. But in respect to, to movement patterns and quality, I mean, a lot of movement starts from the hip. And we're talking gait pattern has got to come from hips. So just the way you walk. Yes. For those listeners, that's our where we walk, way we walk. Hands and arms are going opposite each other as we step, or they should. If they don't, then you have a gait issue and possibly hip issues. But I think a lot of people get tied up when it becomes a what is right and what is wrong, what is optimal, what's not optimal with the hip. And when we're looking for mobility, is the first thing I look for is can this person shift hips? Can they get from a right hip? into a left hip and vice versa side to side without feeling stuck or getting stuck because that inability to shift side to side laterally can limit when we get into bilateral exercises such as deadlift squats or even running. If you're sprinting and you can't drop, come out and shift into your left hip, you're going to have faulty mechanics that aren't going to be the most efficient to get to where you want to be. You'll still be able to run and do all this stuff. So good. Walk, walk me through what you're talking about, about inability to shift your hips. Like how would you have somebody test that out? Just standing and, and switch their weight from the right foot, picking up their left foot and then switch. I would even start. What I like to start at first is I know we we're, we're going to dive in and you heard me talk about sense is have someone stand two feet on the floor and okay. Do you feel their feet on the floor? And then, okay. Have them sway to the right a little bit. And so, okay. Can you sense that? And then have them sway to the other side and can they sense that? Sometimes people can't sense shifting okay. back and forth with minimal Now movement. sensing the shift where? In the hip, in the foot, in the leg, or just in general? Just just in, in general. general. Okay. You can have them close their eyes and move their head slightly to the side. So if you're standing and you move your head to the left, you should feel your body weight shift over to the left because you're changing – where the center of mass is. Same thing with the right. As you, if you move to the right, you should feel that go to the right. If they can't sense that, that doesn't mean they have a hip issue. They might not be able to sense that. So then when, when you can test things that, okay, if they're standing on their right leg in a single leg stance, can they bring their leg up? Like on the FMS inline lunge, perfect example. Dowels on the back, when they pick one knee up, are they stable on one side? And then they go the other leg. Are they unstable? Ideally on that one, when you see someone step, they should be planted on a stance leg. And then when they reverse, they should switch center of mass and be stanced on the other leg. That's another good one I like to use. Time out real quick. Um, And this is actually probably a bigger topic that we could get into later. Um, But don't you feel that the limitation of the FMS is that we typically administer the FMS in a, um, in like a, a person that just came into the gym and they're, they're totally cold, not warmed up, nothing, no like sort of morning routine at the gym, no warm up performed yet. So don't you find that in a way it's a misrepresentation? It's like a false positive. Or do you find that if they're going to come in to me cold like that, that's going to be a good indication of them going to be like that probably 90% of the time. Yeah, I would take, definitely take the latter half because okay. I want the, okay. I want to know what they're going to look like if I ask them to do something on the street or they're just coming in saying, okay, hey, I don't know what's going on because when we get them into a warm-up progression, pro- progression and activation, we're now getting that mental bandwidth. We're taking that and saying, okay, this is what we want. So when they when they're cold in that hurdle step, that's basically giving me a snapshot of what I'm looking at before I coach them. Because once we start cueing, we kind of get a whole different person in front of us. Because now they're 
they're starting to put the pieces together, which is what we was what our job is to do. But at first, you're getting that snapshot of okay, where is this person in space? But that snapshot so, is actually a better representation of their overall, uh, their their what their hips are doing overall through the week versus what they would do in a deadlift or a squat. Yes, I would. I would. I would say yes because they're going to have more more time walking, doing sitting, doing that stuff than actually trying to cue and warm up for a lift that we might do a couple times a week. Now, as we train, it gets better and better because you now direct them to be able to shift into the hips. Yeah. But so a standing, a standing, it doesn't have to have a dowel, just a standing one leg, bring it up into knee flexion and see what their, their balance, their neuromuscular control is you on should one be, side. You should be able to keep that other leg perfectly still. That knee should be able to come up to hip height and you shouldn't have any of lower back rounding or tucking of the tailbone underneath you. Correct? And then I just look at balance. Yeah. Like, can, are, can they comfortably stand on one leg and shift the hips? That's one. I mean, there's multiple ways you can test, but that's a very simple screen. Mm-hmm. If you're like, if you have no equipment, you're like, okay, pick one leg up. And then you ask, what leg do you feel more comfortable on? Mm-hmm. Oh, I feel good on my right leg. Okay. Yeah. What the left leg feel like. Uh, and a lot of time with, with the way we're biometrically kind of built, right side dominance kind of pulls us into the right hip more. And most most humans have a harder time coming out of the right hip and shifting into the left hip. So that's why runners will get their leg to whip around. They come out to the side. Or you're, you're seeing lopsidedness on deadlifts. One hip's higher, one hip's lower on certain bilateral movements. Yeah, you know, I've seen a, I've seen a right side dominant um, baseball player who was a switch hitter and they hit better out of their lefty because they were stuck in that right hip for a while. So it was a lot easier for them to shift their weight forward into that right hip swinging from the left versus having to swing from the right and they would be stuck in that right hip. So it's kind of funny. It's a good example. Yeah, right. Of You need to be able – to shift that dynamically through a movement uh, to be able to, to be able to have the max performance um, out of your system. And I think the other important part um, that I want to mention for hip mobility is its importance in um, the squat pattern and the deadlift pattern that you mentioned yes. earlier, because they're the biggest body movements and they're going to help increase your muscle burn and um, excuse me, they're going to help increase the amount of muscle recruitment, so also help overload your central nervous system, so help promote uh, muscle growth and development for strength or growth development and aesthetics. It's also going to help um, improve the load on your central nervous system in general to make a more of a training effect, so you get some results out of what you're doing, and then you're going to ultimately be burning more calories. So you know, obviously, a lot is there to pick apart. Um, oh, yeah. you know, ankles play a big role as well, but it all um, does. But but talk to me a little bit about um, what you do. Um, you know, just want to kind of throw a couple examples out there for people so they can get an idea of like if they go do a squat and they feel tightness in the front of their hips. Uh, what what would you recommend for them to do? So if we're getting tightness in the front of the hips, it's I usually assume – now, obviously, through years, we're going to assume stuff because we've kind of seen it. Testing is obviously the best measure to go through. But I'll assume that most likely it's the hip flex, flexors playing a giant role in pulling the hips into a position. The hips need to be able to move forward, back, and side to side, tilt forward, externally rotate. When we're doing bilateral movements, most likely they're going to move in the same – direction at the same time we want to keep them and then asymmetrical movements like lunges or whatever they should do the opposite of each other so if we're squatting we're getting those tight hips to me that's that could be a possibility that those hips are too tilted anteriorly so the hips are moving forward which can put the body up and down the chain in a different position but it can actually lock the hips up so as soon as those hips move forward that's going to influence the where the femur and the acetabulum, if those move forward, it can limit range of motion of where that femur is going to go. Hence why you get depth range of motion deficits 
if it's a wide stance versus a narrow stance, the hips are in a, the pelvis are in a different position. But usually that's what I see. If it's tight hip flexors, it's pulled forward. The hips are pulled forward, which then it can place different strains through different muscle chains. Okay. The hips and rib cage, we always want to keep them in a stacked position. Yeah, with so it's support our movement. center of gravity, essentially. Yeah, because yeah, it's, you know, we have a, a few vertebrae below our hips, you know, our coccyx. But other than that, I mean, it's pretty much supporting the rest of our entire spine and, and our torso yeah. and our head. And, and then everything. we have a. So you we run, have a, right, run it, run it, that center of gravity. And that, because, yeah, you give, say you have the big hole in your hips. Yep. Yeah. Pelvic Which floor. Which is basically lovely pelvic floor muscles. But think what sits on top of that is organs and mm-hmm. all that stuff. So we, our hips are kind of like basically the bowl and our lower abs. And we, if we don't have optimal movement of the hips, it can affect all that stuff going on in our cavity. Yeah. And I don't, I didn't want to be too, too general, but basically what I was getting at was just trying to get you to explain the fundamentals, which is just that, okay. you know, the, the, when you lack hip mobility, it's going to manifest itself in tightness in somewhere uh, else, right. In, in your musculature associated with those joints. And, you know, I think a lot of the times we, I do see that tightness in the front of the leg, either usually hip flexor or quad, whether they're just overactive um, or yeah, overactive. I'm, I'm going to keep that terminology. No, nothing more just over. And I'd say that's, but then that's the other, natural. the other one that I see a lot is also, um, we'll say above the hip, like in the back next to the hip. So it could be TFL sometimes for people. It could be deeper musculature and be the QL for some people. And it can actually stem from a tight psoas. So um, I just kind of want to go through and list the different muscles that could be contributing to poor hip mobility and then briefly talk about how we go about uh, turning those muscles off. So I think I think TFL is important to talk about, piriformis, uh, hip flexors, quads, psoas, and QL. So for those of you counting, that's six freaking muscles that do, that's not even all of them that can contribute to you lacking proper hip mobility for a squat pattern or a hinge pattern. Yeah. Right. And that pattern is very easily seen most often with an anterior, like those two patterns, the one we talked about anterior to forward tilt and that one are very similar with like, okay, you're going to be tight with through the hip flexors. And then like glutes, TFLs, anterior glute medes, posterior glute medes, they're all going to be locked in. I think though with our build and biometrically, we have a tendency to, because we're moving forward, we have that always tendency to have an anterior tilt, which is natural. So meaning the hips coming down, meaning the so we're your belt essentially coming yeah. down towards like we your naturally, knees. Yeah. I just was trying to explain for people We naturally listening. have yeah. a forward tilt with a curved lumbar spine. I mean, that's just, we're, we're built like right, that. The S spine. Yeah. So it's easier to fall into the anterior <laughs> pelvic tilt. And it's so true because I've probably have only ever seen one posterior pelvic mm-hmm. tilt. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's, so that's very fair to say. So, um, you know, I think I, I, all, all those oh, muscles, is, um, obviously you can use a lacrosse ball or a foam roller to help, really drive something in there and turn it off. But the QL and the psoas are a little bit trickier because they're deeper musculature and they do require some attention to some trigger points. So I would definitely recommend for someone who's having issues um, with their squat pattern or hinge pattern, if they've already addressed their glutes, their piriformis and their hips to then maybe look up some trigger point psoas and QL releases because those are um, they're tough. Uh, yeah, 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 and they're attached to our spine and the femur. They're and deep. They're they're just they're real yeah, deep. Right. They're, they're sitting. They're, they're not on the outer yeah. layer. You won't see these. It's muscles. nothing you can get on a foam roll and be like, "Hey, I'm gonna foam roll my psoas." You're probably never ever gonna feel a psoas. 
like it's just it's tough. It's a giant player of hip. If you jam a if you jam a ball in there, but yeah, you're not gonna like feel your psoas right. relax and contract. You're not gonna be like, oh, I'm I'm doing a psoas ten reps or something. So like the the other good way I have to tell you is through like repositioning and repatterning to sh- shut those muscle chains down. So usually that psoas is pulling hips and spine forward into a more lordotic curve and anterior pelvic tilt, pulling the hips down and forward, creating that tightness. And then you have the QLs in the back of the spine with the lower ribs and the hips shortening because those muscles are holding you upright vertical as we're going forward. Because if you if they didn't, you just keep leaning forward and no one's going to be standing hunched forward or running hunched forward 24-7. So the the big, I thought the big players for hip mobility to restore those are hamstrings and abs. You get those two, you can shut down and turn down the volume of hip flexors, of psoases, of QLs, of TFLs, because a lot of times the tightness through there is our body just telling us, hold on, I'm using these too much for support. How do we reposition and retrain this? So if you're a person who is struggling with a squat and getting depth, hamstrings are a go-to. 90-90 hip lifts are my favorite. Other things are are dead bug positions, finding hamstrings with feet flat on the floor. That means because you're going to train that and then when you get upright, feeling those muscles, it will keep you in that stacked position. And it will let your hips move appropriately with the rib cage above. And there's just so much that plays into hip mobility. Essentially, it's just like how well can we move hips side to side, forward and back, and not get locked in. And basically, how well can all those movers, all those muscles, um, coexist with each other? When one's turning on, can the other turn off at the right time? Is is one staying on too long? Is one not on at all? Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely a lot of stuff to unpack there, and uh, I don't really have any fun facts about the hip this time. Oh, no fun uh, fun facts. No, I know. Well, the, there was a lot more about the foot and the ankle, but uh, yeah, you know, yeah. It's, hips- it's a ball and socket joint. You, you got two big cavities in each hip. Um, I remember I was looking it up and I think the only other thing I saw was, you know, you obviously have that, you already covered it. We have that big hole right in the center of our hips there. Um, And then there is actually a major difference between um, women's and men's hips because women have to get ready for childbearing and and pushing a a child through. So, um, you know, Shakira is right. Hips, hips don't lie. Um, and and on, and on that note, yeah, you know what? Hips, hips don't lie because uh, I can I tell know. a lot about what's going on in someone's system based upon what's going on with their hips. That is and that, true. That's why that's that why I true. do love the hips because I feel like you you start with the hips, you address the hips, and you address the muscles around the hips. And once you kind of adjust the way that they are moving through space. In, a, in, a, in any movement pattern, you're going to fix the rest of the spine and the rest of the system up and down the chain. So I, I love the hips and just making sure people can squat appropriately and deadlift appropriately or hinge appropriately. Yeah. And with that, you just brought up a good point because a lot of times we can't – the individual can't really feel what our hips are doing because sometimes if, if mm. it just feels normalcy that we're moving yeah. in a pattern, sometimes yeah. you might have to say, hey, hey, Matt, I need you to stand behind me and look at my form and see what's going on and then stand from the side. Do you see anything moving? Do you see my hips shifting? Do you see my weight moving to one side or the other? That is a, a, another big tool that you can use to see where hips are going. Um, yeah. And the other, and you know what? Sorry, go ahead. No, the other thing, only thing I would just say is if people out there are, you're having issues with the squat and hip tightness, try narrowing your stance. Wider stance in the squats can drive a little bit more, rotation through the femurs and the hips are doing different things so that so you can be pointed wide which can actually limit your range of motion so if you come into with a narrower base you're going to align the femurs with the acetabulums the ball and socket 
and you're going to line the the pelvises in a little better position where you can move and them the, more. Typically, when people go wide and and bow their feet out, like toes out at angles, they typically have trouble keeping their adductors firing and their pelvic floor firing, and a lot of that tension ends up in their hips and in their back. And yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, agree. I think I think. Uh, we, we crushed hip mobility. I think one thing that's funny tying it in with mental bandwidth is like you said, kind of having someone looking at your hips or even us as trainers, we will film ourselves so that we can get that different perspective because we don't have the mental bandwidth to perform a loaded exercise at a high intensity and make sure everything's working properly. Um, so on to the food pyramid. Um, save the best for last. Last week we talked about elimination diets and we just kind of wanted to build upon that. So obviously from that phase, someone's kind of establishing what foods they can eat, what foods they can't eat. They're helping to kind of eliminate the inflammation and bloating in their digestive tract and you know free up blood to help clean out other plaques and amylase build up in the system. But now it's like, okay, now how much of what do I eat? So I think the food pyramid is a really good topic to discuss, um, and I want to give like a little brief history um, so we can get a really good perspective on this. So it was actually first started in 1972 in Sweden, and it was developed on the idea of having um, simple foods that were cheap and nutritionist or nutritious, and then they also had. Um, foods that you would supplement in to make up for any nutrients that you could possibly be missing out on. Uh, fast forward to um, 1992, the U.S. started their first uh, food pyramid. What's well, crazy. So the pyramid, yeah, you said 72, but beforehand, like we've had some basic guidelines, nothing crazy, but just like, oh, eat these four to five food groups, eat these seven food groups. It wasn't really until like 72 when they were like, okay, well, ooh, I, we like this concept. Let's take this and apply this to us. Yeah, n- Nutritional science has been in like in the last 50 years and it's been a exponential increase to the knowledge that we've gained as a, as a society, as, as civilization, as human beings. But dude, this picture is so funny. I just want to, I'm going to read it off for people. So this is the first food pyramid developed by the United States um, Department of Agriculture. This says, you call it a <laughs> yeah, the, the basic seven, oh, it's, a food it's a food circle, the, ba- a food circle. <laughs> the basic seven, eat this way every day. It says ready one leafy green, yellow vegetables, one serving, Agreed. one or more servings Two citrus, fruit, tomatoes, raw cabbage, one or more servings, three potatoes, other vegetables and fruits, two or more servings, milk, cheese, ice cream, adults, two or more cups, five, meat, poultry, fish, eggs, dried peas, beans, one to two servings, six, bread, flour, cereals, whole grain, or enriched. That says every day. And then butter and fortified margarine, some daily. And then it follows it up by saying, eat this way every day with a happy family holding hands in the middle. And then at the bottom it says, don't waste food. In addition to the basic seven, eat any other foods you want. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What's this? 1946? Is that the date on this? No, no, no. That one's the 1992 one. The food circle? Yeah. Can't be. At the bottom it says forty six. Oh, oh, I'm I have sorry. It in the 40s yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was the origin of the first pyramid, but this was the first. Sorry, gotcha. thank you. So the USDA and the United States came up with the first pyramid in ninety two, but it was based off the Correct. basic seven that they had already previously established in forty six. Thank you for clarifying that for people. Oh, but yeah, and and, I mean, and you got to kind of think about that contextually. I mean, you got to think that. People probably weren't even eating f- much food back then. There, there, there was probably a short right. supply of food. I mean, I, I remember reading a statistic, and don't quote me on this one, history buffs out there, but something like during World War One and World War Two, thirty percent of the country's agriculture came from gardens in people's backyards. 
So this is like the, the, the basics. This is people who aren't eating sugar every day. And now you fast forward right. to today and the recommendations have to be totally different based upon where the normal bell curve of human behavior has led us. And, and think about that back in the day in 46, we're just coming out of the great depression world. People War. died from malnutrition. People were getting nutrition. So it makes sense where it's like enriched in fortified grains. Like that makes sense because people weren't eating enough. So I, it's just a complete change from then to today. And we're going to, I'll let you back at yeah, it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's just, I think it's, I think it's so important um, that I love the Salman Rushdie quote of basically like to understand uh, a concept, you have to swallow the world. And I, I know I'm paraphrasing that, but it's, it's true. Like you have to kind of look back and dig in and investigate. And that's what we're here to do and help kind of shed light on this and help gain a, a different help give a different perspective for people. So, you know, where we're at today, um, we now have the, um, the, my plate and we'll get to that back to that in a second, but we had a food pyramid between 92 and 2005. And then another one between 2005 and 2011. And they were pretty similar, but essentially it was like, uh, fats, oils, and sugars at the top. Then you had milk and poultry in the second layer. The third layer was fruits and vegetables. And the bottom layer was breads and grains and all that stuff. And now uh, the my plate is a f- little bit of dairy, vegetables, pro- vegetables the biggest. Then then protein and fruits are probably equal. And or actually grains is bigger than protein and fruits. But you get the idea. They're trying to help kind of give you a ratio of how fruits, vegetables, grains, and proteins should work with one another. And now I'm going to respect the fact that it's going to be difficult to make a guideline that's going to work for everybody. But that's why we strip away kind of the bullshit and just try to go back to the fundamentals. So the fundamentals are your system is about 2% carbohydrate. The rest of you is fats and proteins. Um the important part there is you need to be pro to eat, eat, eating protein. Vegetables have a lot of crucial vitamins and other nutrients that play a role in a myriad of metabolic processes. Um, and then I see no problem with fruits except for the way our society is today. It can contribute to people's sugar addiction that they've already started from constantly eating simple carbs and breads and pastas and whatnot. Um, You know, Dr. Burkett back in the sixties or or, and seventies, somewhere in there, he went to study um, colon cancer in Africa, find that they didn't have colon cancer. So started studying what they ate. It ended up being that they were eating more, fibrous things they were eating root vegetables uh jicama barley and he thought that he his observation was they were eating grains so that's where we kind of went from we took the fork in the road and we went wildly down the wrong road and we just need to kind of get back on track a little bit so where where we're at today i believe that the if you take the food pyramid that's actually built like a pyramid and you replace the bottom breads and grains with fiber and side note white rice and sweet potato act like fiber but if you if you make that fiber you're feeding your gut you're feeding your 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 flora if your of your microbiota and your holobiome the bacteria of your whole system And you're also slowing down digestion, bulking up your stool to allow for better absorption of those proteins and fats. So if you you just eat proteins and fats, yeah, it's probably going to go through you pretty pretty readily. And you won't get the most absorption of that stuff. So that's where things like white rice come into play and other fibrous um, foods. So that, that's my takeaway yeah. and that's my um, recommendation to people is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, the food pyramid isn't perfectly right, but there was a lot of things that it did have right. And um, I think we need to 
just adjust refine exactly it. just refine it and, and move refine. forward and don't like start anew and i don't like terms like dairy and grains i like terms like proteins and fats and fibers and starches things that a a, a chemist would use when they're talking about how these processes are operating in the body um yeah. yeah. I mean, the toughest thing for me on the food pyramid is, and I remember reading, seeing this stuff as a kid, but it's just that reading and diving into to some research is you kind of found out who kind of guided and built these things. Like we had nutritionists and scientists, and then you had, okay, this has to go to the you know Secret- Secretary of Agriculture and be passed. And now you have these lobbyists kind of interfering saying, well, you can't say this because of that. So there's – for people that are listening, there was some corruption with earlier models of the food pyramid and there still might be not the best recommendations. Like I, I Matt said, like I think refining it to better words would be better. But we're always in this battle with the higher-ups of lobbyists and big corporations trying to not have their products be completely destroyed. So the biggest thing on that is – it's a rough guideline. There are other recommendations out there for it, but I think what Matt said, vegetables, good source of protein, fiber, and live a healthy lifestyle. I mean, take the food pyramid and especially now the choose my plate. I think the my plate is is more of, okay, this is what you're going to choose and it's personalization, not the pyramid of what you have to follow. Uh, but wrapping that up, I mean, it's a good – suggestion there's so many suggestions out there to eat there's so many diets a lot of them work but maybe we're putting whole foods minimally processed foods on our plate with good sourcing and all that with that goes is is just having the mental bandwidth i mean to pick the right things to put on your plate it kind of all stems back to making good decisions creating more mental bandwidth through yourself and i think once you get to that point boom we're on a good pace we're on the right path we're controlling everything and let's just keep cranking it away. But with all these three topics today, mental bandwidth, hip mobility, food pyramid, they're not something that you're going to set and forget. They're, they're constantly um, evolving and regressing and progressing. Thanks for listening. We hope you gain something from this episode. Our mission is to help people live their best life, both physically and mentally. Check out thinkfitnesslife.com for additional resources and schedule a complimentary assessment with one of us. We're always here to help.